Hello, everyone. My name is Joey Derbyshire, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, problems and things to think about and reflect upon when you're developing in virtual reality. So uh, let me go ahead and share my screen real fast. So uh, first thing I want to talk about um, and discuss about what are we going to be talking about today? So the um, big thing will be unique problems that you'll only really see in virtual reality, as well as um, concepts to really consider that you really wouldn't think about in normal web applications versus virtual reality web applications, and then uh, potential solutions to both, um, as well as whatever I happen to go on a tangent about during the presentation. Uh, so the big thing that you're probably going to run into first then is the distinct lack of peripherals in virtual reality. Um, or as I like to put it, or where are my buttons at? Um, if you don't know who this is, it's a comedian by the name of Brenton Moran. He's got a Netflix special. Uh, pretty funny. It's one of my favorite jokes for him. Uh, so kind of talk about this. So if you think about the VR application, so the first one you have is like the daydream. It only has five buttons, and two of those are for volume here. You really only have like three buttons for interacting with your application. Think about things like um, an HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift. They have 15 to 18 buttons and a couple joysticks. Um, the PlayStation VR will basically just use the PlayStation 4 controller or the PlayStation Move controller, which each have about 18 buttons. Each. Um, so that's a bit, but that's not nearly as much as if you think about like a remote control for your TV has 50 plus buttons or even your keyboard has about 9 million buttons on it. Um, <laughs> to put that in perspective, this is one game that I play pretty regularly called Final Fantasy XIV. Um, if you look down here, each of these little squares things represents an ability or an action that I can do in game. Each one of them has their own unique button combination, as well as this bar over here, these bars down here, this here. Everything on there has its own unique button combination. My mouse has about 17 buttons on it, and I have like three modifiers for it to make it up to about 60 to 80 different combinations of buttons. So how are you possibly supposed to type and control your application in a modern world with only three buttons for like a daydream controller? Um, so the first thing you could kind of do here is you can do an on-screen keyboard. You could point and click at the on-screen keyboard to press buttons. And consoles have done this for a really long time. Um, and it works pretty well for them where they just display the keyboard and you can select the letters to type in whatever you want. Um, this can be very slow, but it can be effective if you need to do things like search or uh, you know, just put in simple short commands. But like I said, it can be slow for the user to input long text. That would not work if I wanted to build an application like Slack. How am I supposed to type to my team if I have to pick and choose every letter? So another thing you can do is what's called triggers. The game I mentioned earlier, Final Fantasy XIV, actually has a version of itself on PS4. Um, as I mentioned before, PS4 control only has 18 buttons. So what they do is they do four of those buttons that are dictated as triggers in the game, and they edit the other remaining buttons to do different actions when they're pressed. And this is just different button combinations in order to achieve a larger variety for controlling in your thing. But you have to remember the big thing when it comes to VR is that you have a third dimension. Your user can implicate motion into your application in order to trigger events in your application. So you see things like gestures and motion are starting to come up real big in the industry. Um, if you look over here, these are just simple gestures you already use on your smartphone in order to do things. And that's just what I would call a two-dimensional gesture system. It only works in a two-dimensional plane so think about in VR where you have a three-dimensional plane that you can utilize in order to represent gestures and motions between your fingers. So if you further the application, you can use things like sign language to possibly input text into your um, application. So sign language would is an already established syntactical language. It already has its own set of rules that could very easily be learned by anybody using VR. And then just even knowing something as simple as the alphabet in sign language could really speed up texting in your application if it became necessary. Um, various other motions and, and stuff of the nature could also really, really improve control of your application. If you think about how head movement, arm movement, all kinds of motion could really play a good, big part in your virtual reality application that you wouldn't normally use in a normal web application. So the next big point that I'm going to talk about is you need to stop thinking in windows and start thinking in rooms. Um, windows are a great thing that we've used over a great convention that we used over the past 20, 30 years or whatever. And it's working fantastically for our computers, our smartphones, everything's in a box. It all stacks on top of each other. It's very well organized. You have to remember that's a two dimensional concept. Windows only have a length and a width and VR you're working with a third dimension. So you have to really think about how 
instead of displaying windows in a virtual reality universe, you would instead display an entire room. Users are going to expect you to utilize that third dimension in a way that is different than what they had used before. Because if they can view your application in VR or they can view it on your computer, there's no reason for them to view it in VR. So I want to give two examples of applications that I think that do this well and do this poorly. So the first one would be the YouTube application for Daydream. If you've ever used it, you're sitting in a large black domed room and floating in front of you is just a window that displays your search options. Um, it's how you interact with it. And if you're watching a two-dimensional video, that window is all you have. If you look around you in these various areas over here and over here in your application, you're just inside of a very empty, large black dome. And there's nothing else to the application if you're just watching that 2D video. On the other hand, if you're watching a 360 degree video in YouTube, it works fantastically. The whole dome just becomes the video and it's very interactive. Um, on the other hand, though, you have things like the Netflix application for Daydream. These are both examples of video applications that I think execute how they display video in different ways. So in the Netflix application, your user is in a cabin that's got a mountainside view in the windows over here. You have TV posters on the walls, modern accessories hung around your place, and you're the screen is actually quite a bit larger in the actual live application than this picture, but um, it really makes you feel very immersed in your environment. You feel like you're sitting in your living room that's very, very nicely laid out watching your TV in a new universe. When you go to start an, or a video or a movie, everything dims around you and the lights go down. And it's very, very immersive in my opinion. Um, but all that being said, 2D video is probably the single worst VR example I could ever display. 2D video just does not work in VR simply because there's no reason to watch it in VR. Um, things you should think about when developing virtual reality applications is how can I take this and expand it to that third dimension? So a couple ideas I've had would be like 3D modeling. Imagine if you had built a large block inside of your 3D modeling application. And in order to build a chair, you just chip away this block, chip away this block, and then you shape the block into the model that you want to build and you can export it. Those are the kinds of things you should really think about when you're building a VR application versus building a normal web application. So the final big point I want to really discuss here is immersion. Um, if you don't know what immersion is, this is how connected the user feels to an application. It's been a big thing in the gaming industry for many, many years about engaging a, a person inside the story and making them feel involved inside of it. So one really good example of immersion, I feel, is um, Fallout does this very well. So instead of displaying menus on the screen, um, like a lot of games or even applications will do, um, they have the thing called the Pit Boy. If you're familiar with Fallout, but you're very familiar with the Pit Boy. So Fallout's based in this post-apocalyptic universe um, that uses kind of old designs using new modern technology. And a Pit Boy is just this large bracelet that the main character of the story wears on their arm. And every time you need to go edit your stats, change your equipment, change settings inside the game, your user or the character will lift up their arm and look at this pit boy and it'll all be displayed on the pit boy. And I think that's a really great example of immersion that can be used in a VR application. So instead of having menus pop up at the windows or whatever in your application, having something like that where the user would control the menus on a section of their body or something that's interactive in the application is a great example of immersion. So what creates immersion for the user? Um, the big thing is your senses. So you have five senses, and that's the big thing you use to interact with the world. So the biggest sense that you're obviously going to use is sight. And sight is clearly massive. It's no big or no small thing in um, VR. But the second sense that you're going to currently use, um, because technology hasn't advanced, to do the other three would be sound. So sound is almost as important, but not quite as important as sound. But it's definitely key for immersing your user inside your virtual application. So there's two big methods of recording sound at the moment. You have stereo sound. Stereo sound uses two main channels. You have a left and a right ear. Um, and then they just play various levels of sound from each ear in order to just, um, create a feeling of being surrounded by your sound. And then the second type of sound is what's called surround sound, which uses five to seven speakers. So my headset is actually surround sound. It is Dolby 5.1 and then if I'm playing a game and something happens back there, I actually hear it as if it's coming from back there as opposed to just in general on my left side. Um, surround sound is there to mimic both distance and direction and sound, but it doesn't work perfectly. And it is really a, just a little bit immersion breaking. You can still tell, tell the difference between surround sound and real sound. So there's a, um, it's not really a new technique, but it's really gaining a lot of ground with VR, which is called bi bineural audio. So 
binaural audio is uh, recorded using this very funny looking mic that you see here that's shaped similar to an ear. Um, and the reason for this is that the ear is already very, very good at transforming sound in a way that your brain can understand the distance and direction that a sound is coming from. So why not utilize the ear in order to record the sound? So the binaural's concept is it bounces the sound around in the shape of an ear and then records it so that when you listen to it, it just sounds as if you're listening to the real world. And uh, I'll have a few great clips to some binaural videos at the end of this presentation when I give up the uh, slides, people want to go listen to it, but it sounds very, very real and very nice, especially on my uh, headphones and definitely wear earplugs when you're uh, listening to it. So the last big thing you got to think about when you're developing VR is spatial awareness. Um, this is kind of an or a situation where your user is too immersed in your application and they forget that they exist in the real world. Um, you have to remember that the user still has things around them, even if they forget that they're there for a second. And they won't be happy if they accidentally punch their computer or bash their leg against their coffee table. So you have to really be careful when you're creating the gestures and motion inside your application that you aren't suddenly flinging their user's arms around and breaking something. And it's really important to keep that in concept. But that being said, I am not by any means an expert in this topic. And for that matter, no one is. VR is still in its baby stages. And this is the point where conventions that are going to last for decades to come are going to be created. And things that will be become standard for VR are going to suddenly become very changing and evolving over the next few years. And uh, the big thing with VR is to remember you are creating a new universe and you get to set those rules yourself. Um, you can no longer be limited by what you can do on a screen or what you can do in real life because suddenly you are in a new place. And so feel free to go wild with it and think of the previously impossible. But um, always remember that at the end of the day, function is still over are still king over form. So a big concern that you have with VR applications at the moment in the industry is the idea that some VR applications are very gimmicky and they're very um, tech demo-y. So be very careful when you're developing applications that you don't really fall into that trap of making something that's too gimmicky. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with this quote, I guess, that uh, to remember, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard this at, at some point, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Here's some links to some cool videos I found throughout making this, and uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much.